Hi, everyone. I'm Cheryl, and I'm here on behalf of the Barrington residents that are appealing the building of a PBCC meeting hall and school. And with me is Richard, who is an ex-member of the PBCC and has extensive research and hands-on experience with this matter. So I'm just going to hand it over to you, Richard. And what do you have to say about this? Yeah, hi everyone. I'm I'm Richard. I'm a former member, as Cheryl said, and I've been involved in the design and construction of their church buildings from about 1990 right through to 2015 when I left the sect. Uh, my father built one of their first modern meeting halls in Cambridge in the UK when I was 20 years old. I worked on that construction site from breaking ground till completion. I've built architectural models for a meeting hall in Sweden. Um, I've worked on several hall construction sites in the UK and Canada, and, and I've visited probably about 100 different PBCC meeting halls around the globe in the UK, Australia, Germany, Canada, and the USA. The last hall I worked on was just over the border in Oxbow, Saskatchewan, and is identical to the hall proposed for this site in Barrington. That was completed in 2010. I should add that these are not churches in the normal sense of the word. Even PBCC members refer to them as meeting rooms. Conference center would probably be the most accurate description. The word church actually has negative connotations uh, within the PBCC, uh, and it's been eliminated from their version of the Bible. They have no religious architectural ornaments, no steeple or bells, no altar, no crosses, no piano, organ or musical instruments, no flowers, no stained glass, in fact, no windows at all. The design of these halls is all centrally dictated from the HQ in Sydney, Australia, and they're all identical down to the last detail. You can walk into one of these halls anywhere on the globe, and there is no clue as to what country you're in it will be exactly the same as your local hall back home. This means I can tell you rather accurately what the PBCC are proposing to build here, despite the very limited plans they have submitted. These halls are very simple structures. They consist of two main parts, a square auditorium with concentric rings of bench seats and a large foyer with coat pegs, restrooms on either side. The one thing that has changed over the years is the size of the halls, and this reflects the exponential growth in the number of PBCC members. In the 1970s, the auditoriums were 50 foot by 50 foot. In the 1980s, they were 60 foot by 60 foot. In the 1990s, they went up to 70 by 70 foot, and that was considered to be a 1,000 seat meeting room. The current design, which originated in the 2000s, has a 90 by 90 foot auditorium, and that's what we have here. A 90 by 90 foot room plus the foyer and storage rooms comes to just 17,000 square feet. And that is what it says on the plan. This is considered to be a 2,000 seat room, as I'll explain later. There are very few images online showing the interior of a PBCC meeting hall because they're not open to the public. The only time a non-member gets to see the inside is when they outgrow a hall and it's put on the market. This video is from a real estate advertisement for the London UK Hall, which has a total area of 7,000 square feet. The new hall proposed for Barrington will be identical to this, save that at 16,000 square feet, it will be two and a half times larger.
So you'll have noticed a few things. High security gates, high fences, cameras, floodlights. These are typical and Barrington will be the same. The entire site will be behind six foot steel security fences. You will notice that there's an extraordinary sliding door between the foyer and the meeting room. This is significant, as I will explain later. So here is a detailed plan of a PBCC 17,000 square foot meeting hall. This is what you will get in Barrington. On the left, the foyer with male and female restrooms on opposite sides. Then the huge 40 foot wide sliding door into the hall, which has octagonal rings of bench seating. There is a 15 foot wide side corridor, which also has a 40 foot sliding door to the hall. And on the far right, there is a series of large storage rooms. Also at the right, outside of the hall, you can see three huge air conditioning units. Each of these is the size of a semi-trailer. These are many times larger than you would expect for a building of this size. The claimed capacity of this hall, based on the length of fixed seating, is 1,156 persons. This assumes a comfortably low density arrangement where there's a few inches of airspace between each person. This, however, is not how the hall is used. For special occasions, the brethren are crammed into the fixed seating at a very high density, hip to hip, shoulder to shoulder, practically full body contact. Once the fixed seating is filled, then the aisles are filled with stacking chairs, which are brought in from those large storerooms at the back. Members will carry their chair into the room to the next available space in the aisle, put it down and sit on it. In this way, all the aisles can be completely filled. The next plan shows how this is done. First plan here shows the fixed seating only. And then the second plan shows what it looked like when all the aisles, including the circulating aisle, have been completely filled with loose chairs. The third plan shows how the main foyer and side corridor are filled with chairs by opening the sliding doors which connect them to the main hall. Now the reason for the sliding doors becomes clear they almost double the seating capacity. With this number of persons crammed into such a small place, the huge air conditioning units are essential to prevent everyone from overheating and to pump enough oxygen into the room. Now, if we look closely at the restrooms, we can see more evidence of this practice. There are no less than 71 toilets and urinals, provision for 71 people to urinate or defecate simultaneously. Again, several times the number you would expect for a building of this size. There is also documentary evidence of this practice. The PBCC is led by a single charismatic leader or elect vessel whose every word is transcribed and published in bound volumes which are distributed to every member. The current leader is Bruce D. Hales from Sydney, Australia, and the previous leader was his father, John S. Hales. Here is a 2010 quotation from Bruce Hales, taken from the Brethren's own printed literature. Father used to say that four square feet per person. I suppose that he was allowing for the little people. So if we had 440, you could probably get 100 people in there. You'd have to get a little bit more air conditioning. The context of this quote is the number of persons that can be fitted into a meeting hall. He's quoting from his father, John S. Hales. He gives the example of a small 440 square foot room having the capacity for over 100 persons. In other words, the number of persons equals the number of square feet divided by four. The auditorium of the hall planned for Barrington is 90 feet square. 90 by 90 equals 8,100 square feet. Dividing this by four gives 2,025 persons, which is why this is referred to in the Brethren as a 2,000 seat hall. The foyer is 50 by 63 feet, giving an area of 3,150 square feet and will hold 787 persons. The section of the side corridor facing the sliding door is 40 by 15 feet, giving an additional 600 square feet and will seat 150 persons. The total capacity of the room for special occasions then is about 2,962 persons. 
Each time the brethren hold a special occasion, they print a booklet for the event with a list of all those invited. These booklets do indeed show that about 3,000 persons may attend meetings in these 17,000 square feet halls. What about fire regulations and fire exits? These are completely ignored. As I'll explain, the PBCC have a very strained and adversarial relationship with the world at large, which they consider to be ruled by Satan. As such, when it suits their purpose, they do not feel constrained by worldly laws when they're in their own sanctuary. The only plan I have is this rather hard to read one from the Barrington Observer. We can see at the top there is a proposed school with gym building and attached to the school a proposed store. This store will be a Campus & Co. superstore, the Brethren's Own Members Only Supermarket, the purpose of which is to capture all the members' expenditure and keep it within the sect rather than going to worldly shops in the communities in which they live. These are very nice high-end supermarkets, but are most definitely not open to the public. One thing that may be of concern to Barrington residents is that wherever possible, Campus & Co. outlets apply for liquor license and do a very heavy trade in alcohol, consumption of strong liquor being an integral part of the Brethren culture. The picture here is of the liquor section of a Campus & Co. store in the UK. If we zoom in on the plan of the store building, we can see an extension with a diagonal corner that faces a straight section of road. This is a loading bay for semi-trailers and suggests that it will not just be a Campus & Co. outlet, but a hub store which will contain refrigerated warehousing and storage and will be used to supply smaller stores in the surrounding region. The representatives of the PBCC probably forgot to mention that in addition to the church traffic and the school traffic, there will also be shoppers and semi-trailers of groceries using the site. Another point to make regarding this plan the parking spaces as drawn are a good 10 feet wide. The standard width for a parking space is eight feet. The result of this is that whatever number of parking spaces the brethren say they will be providing, in practice, they get about 20% more. They use this same trick on a recent planning application in the UK, where a sharp-eyed journalist noticed and called them out on it. That is how I knew to check the size of the spaces on this plan. There has been very little information available about what the school will look like, but fortunately the PBCC fairly recently completed an almost identical compound to this proposal in the Canadian town of Stonewall near Winnipeg in Manitoba. Here is a Google aerial view of the completed site. On the far left, the grey roof building is the 17,000 square foot meeting hall with its large parking lot and on the right, the school with a separate gym. Using Google Street View, we can drive by and see the building from ground level. This is the back end of the meeting hall. And here is the front. So here we can see that same Stonewall meeting hall uh, and this time there's actually one of the Brethren's special occasions or fellowship meetings or three-day meetings, as they call them, in progress. And you can see they've erected an enormous circus-type tent in front of the hall, which actually connects through into the foyer of the building. Uh, and the reason they have this, this is for, like, catering. They have teas. They're providing, they're providing food in this hall here um, for, the, for the attendees. And, and the reason they have to have the tent is that the foyer is, is full of chairs. So that the, the space that would normally be used for a foyer is full of chairs. So they put up a tent and in the tent, that's where they have all their kind of coat racks and their food and their catering for the event. Uh, the other thing to know about the way the, the Brethren organize their, their gatherings, their meetings, is that in addition to having what they would call a city room, which is this very large 16,000 square feet room you see, they also have local rooms. And so for each 50 or so members, they will have a local room, which will be a much smaller room, usually like the size of a, a bungalow. And in the case of Chicago, with the number of Brethren they have that will be moving to this area, 
they're going to have at least five smaller local meeting halls. And typically the way they the way they do this is they buy a house or buy a bungalow or buy a residential lot and they put up a meeting hall on it. They'll they'll occasionally they'll use the existing structure, but usually they'll bulldoze the house, build a small meeting hall with maybe 25 or 30 parking spaces. So when you get a big brethren meeting hall, keep in mind that within a year or so you're also going to have five small halls all in the same area. The school is difficult to see from the road, but here is a similar PBCC campus in Ireland. As a former member, I was amused to hear the PBCC representative say, we're looking forward to being your neighbors. This is a very long way from being the truth. As mentioned before, the brethren regard the whole world as being under the influence and power of Satan, along with the inhabitants thereof. That includes the good citizens of Barrington. The 2011 quote below from the elect vessel illustrates this. Can the family see that we're dedicated to separation from the world? Well, how would that be practiced? Would they let a neighbor into their house, for instance? Would they let worldly people, would they let their children get involved with other worldly children? See, that's the teaching, and that should be intrinsically, intuitively built up in a household, separation from the world. And then, the idea of mixing with your neighbors and that kind of thing. I mean, you live, you only live sort of 20 feet one way and 20 feet the other way from everything pretty much that could take you clean out of the fellowship. So what have we got to do? We've got to provide an atmosphere in our households and control and affection and authority so they don't get involved. The term worldly people simply means anyone who's not a member of the brethren. They regard all such with a mix of fear and suspicion, and you need not bother to ask them in for coffee or invite them to your barbecue. They won't be coming. This is an extremely insular and self-serving community who have as little to do with the outside world as they possibly can. Don't linger, don't stay, don't mingle, don't mix. Rigid separation. Get out of worldly company as quick as you can. They aim to be self-sufficient in every regard, right down to having their own schools, supermarkets, and businesses. Brethren do not work for non-brethren businesses. They aim to provide full employment for every, every member. Even their phones, computers, and telecom services are all provided in-house. This doctrine of separation from the wicked world becomes problematic when they actually need something from the world that they despise, such as planning permission. To get around this, they have an unspoken law that says it's okay to lie and deceive worldly persons in order to obtain what the church needs. It is still considered a very serious offence to lie to other members. This principle is referred to obliquely in the 2012 quote from Bruce Hales below. She gave them a false, false lead. That's good. She leaked some very, very valuable information that was completely untrue. She sent them forth, and she would fit into this idea of the secret service, which is a very essential part, really, of the way the recovery has been sustained. An example of of this deception is the statement by the PBCC representative that the hall would only be used for a large event once per year or less. What he failed to mention is that a PBCC conference consists of five sessions spread over three days. The number of traffic movements is therefore much greater than for a single event. The spokesperson also says that there are other new halls in nearby cities with the same capacity. This leaves the obvious question as to why such a huge and expensive hall would be built and equipped for such large numbers if the PBCC already has other facilities that they could use. Recent news from contacts within the PBCC says that they are now using these larger halls for business conference as well as for religious services. This is another point that the Barrington residents should require to be clarified before planning permission is granted. In conclusion, this development will contribute nothing whatever to the Barrington community and will generate a very substantial amount of traffic, far more than the misleading numbers presented by the PBCC would indicate. The so-called church is not a place of public worship. 
It is more akin to an exclusive private club, and the entire site will be fenced and gated off with no public use of the land or facilities permitted. The church designation serves only to exempt the development from property tax and thus from contributing to the Barrington community, even financially. I would suggest that the council sit down with the PBCC and obtain an honest and accurate account of what their real intentions are before making a planning decision on this site. Thanks so much, Richard, for giving us that very precise and detailed account of what really is going to be happening there. And we really hope that this serves as wake up call to what really is behind their plans. You're welcome, Cheryl.